All right, so sorry that we couldn't have our Zoom session today. Uh, it was in a personal professional development thing that uh, ran a little bit long and during our class, but uh, I do still want to go over the DBQ. I want to make sure that you guys have all the information that you need to have so that way you can kind of assess yourselves and see how you're doing, right? Um, so today we're going to go over DBQ4. Uh, I'm going to go over kind of scoring wise, what things would work, what things wouldn't work. Um, but this one is very open. Um, there are a lot of things that you can kind of go with. Um, and much like the last DBQ, I feel like this one is also probably more similar to what you'll actually see on test day than maybe some of the original ones, just because the time period lends itself to more broad interpretation, right? So uh, without any further ado, let's get after it. All right, so starting it right out the gate. Um, the prompt is develop an argument that evaluates the extent to which the consequences of imperialism transform societies in the era of 1750 to 1900. So you can still talk about um, some of the events, the things um, that occurred at the beginning of this time period in your contextualization. A lot of the documents, as in like all of them, uh, essentially talk about things that happened in the late 1800s, mid-ish, uh, all the way up until like right at about 1900. Right. So um, context wise, you can use things that happen at the beginning of this time period. So um, you can look at like the initial colonization of Africa. Um, you can look at the slave trade. That's the easiest way to talk about contextualization in this regard is that um, you can talk about like Atlantic Triangle trade and the fact that Europeans had already established colonies in the Americas and they needed to bring in slaves from Africa um, to essentially get them their wealth that they had growing in the Americas. So um, I would definitely bring that up for your context. Um, there are other ways that you can kind of address some things in this. Um, you can talk about some other stuff, but ultimately um, really trying to hammer home the fact that Europeans had already taken over other places. Um, and this is just going to be how they exploit them um, moving forward. So this isn't a matter of conquering new places as much as it is um, Europeans already establishing themselves there and more or less just being justified in their ruling according to them. But really we're looking at how the native people get exploited in these documents. Um, so when you are uh, addressing kind of your context point, um, anything that talks about how these places got conquered, that's fine anything that talks about the goods and services that essentially were being done that required more people or more goods to be brought there, that kind of works. Um, but make sure that, you know, you really kind of are sp specific to the fact that it's Europeans imperial being Imperials to other places, right? This is almost exclusively going to be about um, how other places were affected by the Europeans, right? So, um, the nice part is you can talk about Africa and Africans being brought to other places, but you can also use that to explain um, how and why, you know, European changes affected other places like China and Japan, right? So um, the other unique thing about this DBQ, this is the first DBQ that doesn't have a picture, but instead a graph, right? So um, keep in mind that both of those essentially count as the same thing. They are non-text-based things. That's all that it is essentially telling you is that one thing is going to be non-text-based. So I am interested to see how many of you guys use the graph, and more importantly, how many people use the graph appropriately, right? So um, without any further ado, let's jump into that. Um, thesis stuff. Um, when it comes to the thesis point in, in this regard, I think there's several ways that you can discuss all of the things moving forward. Uh, I think some of the more obvious ones, um, it talks about slavery being um, implemented and or also abolished. It talks about businesses um, kind of oversaturating a market um, and taking away goods from one place to another. Um, and it also just more or less talks about the subjugation of peoples. So that kind of goes in with slavery a little bit. Right. So um, those are some serious things that it talks about, but there's many different things that you could build your thesis around. Here. Um, the ones that I think I would focus on the most, though, 
um, are going to be how the local people's economies were changed um, due to imperialism and also how local peoples were treated because of imperialism, right? So again, and it's how did it transform societies, right? That's the prompt here. It does not specifically say how does it transform just the people who were being governed. And it also doesn't say the people who were actually doing the imperialization, right? It can be about all of them, right? So this is one of um, the few times where it doesn't specifically tell you one group or the other. Um, it's everyone, right? It's just how did it transform all societies? So you can look at European societies, you can look at African societies, um, in this especially Chinese societies, um, right? You can look at all of those um, or just one or two of them. However you want to approach that, you can pull off from this DBQ. It is much more wide ranging in that regard, right? So um, in your thesis statements though, I would definitely make sure that you absolutely hammer which point you are going to talk about um, and which specific things changed in society, right? Um, there's so many ways to go though. So really you can kind of argue how it made European society better. You can talk about how it made other societies worse. Um, and then you just kind of have to be specific about what things got better or worse kind of throughout. So um, this is a very broad, wide ranging thesis that you can really, really stretch out into a lot of different things. So um, document one, um, when it comes to sourcing this document, um, it is important to note, it is a book that is published in 1991, so very much addressing the past uh, on this. Uh, and whenever it comes to when it's actually being changed, if you look, it's simply a book. It's all about tradition and change. Oh, just kidding. Before we get into the documents, what type of essay should this be? Um, this can be anything. Um, you can compare um, how societies were before and after. You can compare societies during. You can compare, um, you know, European societies versus other societies. Um, it can be a continuity and change. You can say, you know, what was the same, what was different over the time period. Um, that is especially evident in the Chinese document. So there's that. Um, and less so a causation, but you can look at how, um, you know, what the effects of imperialism were. It, but you would really have to talk about what caused imperialism to happen. Um, so harder to argue that one, but um, definitely lends itself very easily to a compare, uh, to a comparison essay where you can compare um, each region and or each time period. Right? So um, there's that before we get into document one. So within document one, um, sourcing is going to be difficult unless you know anything about the authors, which I don't. I have no idea. So if you quick Google them, um, you can find out a little bit of information about them. But in all honesty, um, sourcing for all of these documents is going to be much harder um, than some of the other earlier ones. There aren't very many that are written directly to people. Um, and sourcing a novel is always going to be harder than sourcing a letter, right? Um, so this is a scholarly work, though. It is meant to be a book. It is just a book. It's about um, it's a nonfiction book that is just out there for people to read to find out more about history, right? So uh, it's all about Latin American traditions and changes uh, that happen. So um, take that and run with it if you can with sourcing, but a little bit hard here. Um, when it comes to the document itself, uh, it's uh, summarizing it essentially saying that Peru built its entire economy around this specific fertilizer. Um, that Europeans absolutely loved. The British loved it. It was a fantastic fertilizer um, that they could bring over because the birds there pooed a special poo from their diet that seemed to work really, really well at growing crops in Europe, right? So um, the British essentially were buying all of the fertilizer they could get there until all of a sudden in 1870, new fertilizers came out and they realized, oh, we can make chemical fertilizer and it's way cheaper than having to ship our fertilizer all the way from South America and bringing it all the way back over. Let's just do that. And when that happens, the Peruvian bank, uh, banking system and government literally completely collapse. 
they built their entire economy on one product. And as soon as the British didn't need it anymore, their entire economy closed. So what are some consequences for imperialism here? Some things you could have argued. Um, number one, um, it meant that colonial states ended up building their economy on cash crops and exports, right? They built their entire economy on what can we sell to Europeans, um, right? They also built up um, banking systems that relied um, on foreign trade, right? On an interconnectedness between um, multiple different places around the world kind of trading with one another. Um, so we see globalized trade, we see um, a specialized economy during this time period, but um, it also briefly um, talks about Chinese immigrants coming in and working for low wages. Um, so you can see like, how did that transform society? Well, it brought more immigrants in to work low paying jobs. Um, that's gonna be something that kind of transcends this time period and carries on throughout. So. Um, all of those are things you could use to build your argument around in terms of um, like what you would use for evidence there. So uh, all of those would be pretty excellent um, kind of ways to go about it. Um, for outside evidence, um, if you want to look at how Peru structured their economy now, that might be a way to run with it. Um, you could also kind of look at this and see, um, you know, kind of, what this did to Peru's trade um, and how they engaged with other countries with trade from there on out. But um, in all honesty, um, the, the way that I would kind of approach outside evidence for this one is that I wouldn't. Um, I, I don't know if I would really necessarily um, kind of try to bring in outside things because there's so much within this document. It's gonna be hard to bring in something from the outside to kind of build into an argument when there's so many opportunities to build your argument just from the actual information within this document, right? Um, document two, a lot easier to source. Um, it is a scholar writing to an official. Um, he is very much trying to persuade um, the official to take a more European approach um, to society. Um, it is very much um, written in a formal tone um, while also um, coming across as begging and pleading, right? He even says at the end, I beg your majesty, right? Like, um, so you can look at the tone and the point of view for this. Um, you can address the audience um, in, in that regard too as being an official. Um, there's a lot more easy and direct ways to source this document. So um, this would definitely be one that I would attempt to source if I was in your guys' shoes. And that's kind of the approach that I would take um, is I would look at how it was written and to whom it was written, right? So. Um, both of those are approaches that you could definitely run with. As to what this document is saying, this document is basically saying China's economy is not going to work and the reason they're falling behind is because they're holding on to what is old instead of embracing what's new, right? Um, so when it comes to changing society, um, imperialism taught China that it cannot survive the way that it once did. Right. Um, if you look at the time period, this is in 1898. So in 1898, um, the author is making a, an argument saying we cannot do things the same way that we did during the Han and the Tang and the Yuan and the Ming dynasties. We can't be that same peoples anymore. Um, he makes a comment and saying, like, after studying the ancient you know, institutions, he's found that, you know, the sage kings of the three dynasties were excellent. But ancient times are different than today, so we need to embrace today, right? So um, in terms of changing up society, if you look at the last sentence there, that last sentence gives you so much information, right? So he says, I beg your majesty to adopt the purpose of Peter the Great of Russia uh, as our purpose. So essentially taking on the purpose of building up your own empire and um, embracing kind of the outside and, and in bringing it into your own culture, um, taking things from other places and um, adding to them, right? And then he says, um, and to take the Meiji reform of Japan as the model for our reform. He's looking to take away power essentially from local nobles, if you will, um, and to essentially get rid of their feudal system essentially and build up a parliament, build up a constitution, um, add in more democracy instead of it just being a dictatorship under an emperor. Um, 
that's a massive change to society. That is changing up the entirety of the like, social structure um, thanks to inspiration from other regions, right? So it's, it's bringing in ideas from other places and showing how interconnected the world is now, right? Um, so that's kind of how, how I would run with this document, how I would interpret it, and how I would work that into my argument and say, you know, bringing in ideas um, from other countries and finding the best thinkers and best um, revolutions that occurred during this time period and implementing them into different regions is also a way in which imperialism, right, affected society. For document three, um, document three is a book. It is the book called The Original Corporate Raiders. It was published in 2015. And it's all about the East India Company. And essentially, um, in this document, it talks about how the East India Company, even though it only has 35 full-time employees in Britain, becomes the wealthiest company in the entire world. Um, and it talks about how this company took over an entire country. And when they did so, um, they did so by military and also by flooding the market with British goods. And that's where I would tie it into your argument, right? So um, you can bring up the fact that um, it shows interconnectedness again by saying you know, British goods are being sold in India. Um, it talks about how the Indian economy um, used to be built around these high class weavers, but is now um, completely switched over to them being subjects um, and essentially working fields and crops um, for the British. It talks about military conquest. Um, so you can kind of look at military aspects if you wanted to from this one. Um, but if this document has a ton of things that you can use to kind of talk about how Indian society turned into a more subject um, and uh, being the lower um, kind of subjects to the British. Um, but it also talks about how British society um, also changes, right? The British gain access to all of these different things because of the British East India Company. Um, so they gain a lot out of it that way. Um, the thing that's in here by a lot, he says, like, he returns to Britain with a personal fortune, then valued at 234,000 pounds, which in today's money is about $23 million, which is a pretty good day that he had, um, but also for the company. So you can talk about how the British economy um, very much flourished because of um, their conquests in other regions, right? So the British economy went way up and people had a ton of money in Britain because they were conquering other places. So you can use that to kind of make your argument as well. Um, but you can look at how life was changed in both different places during this one and almost compare and contrast within the document um, how different things were, right? Life got much better for the British people uh, because they had access to all this new money and goods and wealth. And life got a lot worse for the Indian people because now they were subjects to other places, other people. Right. So um, just kind of a, a way in which you can use this document to go through either one. Uh, right. And also, if you were talking about governmental affairs and like oversight, it talks about how this was an unregulated company, um, like government oversight was not a thing. Um, so if you were going to use that as an argument, during like how society changed thanks to imperialism, um, this would also work for that. Um, for document four. Um, document four uh, essentially is all about um, a British, Afri or, I'm sorry, uh, an African veteran uh, of a war against the British advances in South Africa. So this is a South African. Um, this again would be the document that I would source a lot better than the other one, right? So um, it, within this, you could talk about the fact that this is an African um, actually talking about his, like his uh, not exploits, but his experience in the war. Um, and how this rebellion started, but all these British showed up. Um, you could talk about how personal this was to him as he mentions his cousins being shot, um, right? So you can really kind of see the, the fact that this is a personal plea um, in, in kind of showing how, how horrible it was for the local peoples um, to be treated this way and how they were affected. Right, so you could look at this as a very personal document. You can address the audience in that way and say, this is him essentially just venting and um, talking about his own personal experience, right? That changes the tone uh, in which this was written as well. 
As for the actual context of it, you could talk about, again, interconnectedness because the British are essentially coming into South Africa. Uh, it shows how they were treated, the people that were there were treated like slaves. Um, they came more overbearing, right? They, they harmed our wives and our daughters. Uh, they made them carry, home, carry all of their clothes and goods. Um, so you could talk about how life was definitely never the same for South Africans. Um, you could also use this time to talk about how imperialism brought about the spread of technology. Um, the whole reason why they lost, they said, is because the white man had machine guns, right? So if you were going to use imperialism to talk about the spread of goods to other places, um, you know, you can look at the first document with the fertilizer and this document with machine guns and say, look, you know, um, things are being brought from other places into Europe and it was better for Europeans and Europeans were bringing things like machine guns to other places which although killed a lot of people that technology and the access to technology was also kind of a betterment for them right so um, you can kind of look at that running either way um, but you can build your argument from this document around the way in which the Africans were treated um, or you could build your argument around the fact that they brought in new, gu no, new guns and new technology, right? So you can kind of use that either way. Document five, good luck sourcing a chart. Um, gonna be hard there. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about the actual things. Um, so it says it's a chart depicting the growth of the Japanese economy after the Meiji res Restoration, uh, an era that brought about the modernization and westernization of the country. If you focused on the fact that imports and exports used to be equal and now they are importing more than they export, you can make an argument for that. You can talk about how that shows that Japan was trading with the outside world more um, and the fact that you know that shows how interconnected everyone is. Um, it shows that it's more westernized because they're importing more things from other places, um, right? So um, you can use that as your argument. Um, if you just use the fact that they are doing both, if they are exporting way more now than they used to, you can use that to show that they were connected with other places as well. Um, it's hard to make any argument other than the fact that society got better off during this time period. Um, they both imported and exported more, which shows that the wealth of the country went way up, right? So society got more westernized. Um, it says that in the very top uh, description here, but if you talk about the fact that they're now importing more than they're exporting, um, that's a good way to, to build an argument here um, in terms of how imperialism connected Japan to the rest of the world. Um, but you could also use it to show that they were importing and exporting more, um, which shows that they were able to conquer other places, right? They started doing the same thing that the other Western nations did they realize that if you build your economy on trade, you can become more wealthy than if you build your economy on self-sufficiency, right? So they built up everything on selling and buying things from other places in the world. Um, so that's kind of two ways that you can make that argument run. Um, once again, if you have any questions about anything that I said in here, if you would like to go over your DBQ, this one is a rather tricky one. There are so many different ways you could go that it's hard for me to give you one single concrete, this is the way you should interpret this document. Um, I think it's a lot easier um, in that regard to then say that because of that, you should really stop kind of trying to hyper analyze yours in terms of this um, and just use what I said throughout this video as kind of a guide to whether or not you are on the right track, right? If you have, individual questions please by all means pop in um, during office hours i will certainly um, try to answer as many questions as i can um, i will go over any essays that you would like me to go over um, and i hope you guys have a great day um, we will have a meeting on friday um, i will be there i will talk about all this stuff again if you, if you can't make it during the office hours other times um, but i hope to see uh, any of you that you have questions drop in, send me a text, send me an SB message, whatever you need to do. Um, have a good day, though.